Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all. all Thy power and thine alone can change the leper's spots and melt the heart of stone. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a to claim I'll wash my garments white in the blood of Calvary's land Jesus paid it all all to him I owe sin had left the crimson stain And when before the throne I said in him complete Jesus died my soul to save My lips shall still repeat Jesus paid it all John chapter number 4, beginning in verse number 1, I want to read all the way down to verse number 10. The Bible says this, There when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. Uh, then the woman of Samaria said to him, How is it that you, being a Jew, ask a drink from me, a Samaritan woman, for Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said to her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is who says to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for the precious and powerful word of God. We thank you for the presence of the Holy Spirit 
with us as we speak the truth of Scripture. And so, Father, I want to pray that you'll uh, help us today as we look at these verses to be able to bring words of encouragement to those who are without hope and need to be encouraged, to need to be strengthened in their, in their faith. Some are discouraged. Others need to be saved. And Father, we know that regardless of what need a person may have, you are able to meet that need. So Father, we just pray that your blessings be upon this sermon, and we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Amen. Uh, Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem uh, when the time had come for him to be received up. Uh, the time had come for him to die, uh, to be raised again from the grave, and to ascend back into heaven. And in another portion of Scripture back in Luke's Gospel, the Bible says he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Jesus was completely aware of the suffering that he was about to face, and yet he was determined that nothing would keep him from fulfilling God's plan to provide salvation for all of mankind. Some of his disciples were uh, sent ahead to a village in, Jamer in Samaria to request Jesus be allowed to pass through uh, their city. But because Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, the request was denied uh, for him to pass through that city. Uh, and the request was denied because the Samaritans and the Jews, they didn't get along. They actually hated each other. And so when James and John heard their quest, request had been denied, they were so angered that they asked Jesus to just let them call fire down from heaven and to destroy the Samaritans and everybody living in that city. However, Jesus had an important lesson that he wanted these men to learn. Uh, he tells them, the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's life, but to save them. Jesus demonstrated this truth throughout his earthly ministry. For example, Jesus came to save good men like Nicodemus. He was religious, but he was lost. He knew there was something in his life that was missing, so he came to Jesus. Jesus tells him, unless you are born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. Uh, to be born again, it means to be born from above. Jesus tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. Jesus not only came to save men like Nicodemus, good moral men, but Jesus also came to save deceitful men like Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector. He was the most hated man in Jericho, and he was well aware of that fact. Tax collectors, uh, they collected taxes for Rome. They had a certain amount that Rome required them to tax and to collect, and everything above Rome's require, requirement, they got to keep for themselves. And so Zacchaeus, he was a Jew who had sold his services to the hated Romans, and because of that, he was hated by his own people. And as Jesus was passing through Jericho, he looked up and he sees this high-ranking governmental official sitting up in a sycamore tree. Now, a sycamore tree was a somewhat short, sturdy uh, tree, and its limbs grew outward. And the limb that Zacchaeus had found to be seated on, it kind of grew out over the street. And as Jesus came to Zacchaeus, he looked up and said, Zacchaeus, uh, come down, for today I must stay at your house. But in John 4, that passage that we read just a moment ago, there's another story about Jesus changing lives. There's another must situation. In John 4, 4, if you're reading in the King James Version, the Bible says, and he must need go through Samaria. Uh, this takes place earlier in the ministry of Jesus, and he is leaving Judea on his way to Galilee. His reception that day was quite different from the one we just mentioned earlier, when he was not allowed to journey through uh, their city. Jesus had to go through Samaria uh, because he knew there would be a woman there whose life was 
very troubled. It was filled with trouble, her life. Uh, he wanted to deliver her from the bondage she had been living in for such a long time. Now, the first thing I want to call your attention to in this passage of Scripture is her story. And most of you are quite familiar with the story of this Samaritan woman. But notice again in verses 1 through 7 of John 4. It says, Therefore, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had uh, heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. But he needed to go through Samaria. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of the ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, he sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour, and a woman of Samaria came to draw water. Now notice again, a woman of Samaria came to draw water. This reveals to us that Jesus is the Savior of the world. This reveals to us that Jesus wants everybody to be saved. In bringing the Samaritan woman to forgiveness and faith, and delivering her from the burden she was living under, Jesus had to deal basically with three problems in her life. Number one, there was a social problem. She was the wrong person. She was a woman and not a man. You see, in that day, women had no social status at all. For example, in that day, it was not appropriate for a man to speak to a strange woman. During the first century, women were considered to be inferior to men. Ancient Jewish writings, which forms the basis of Jewish religious law, said he who talks to a woman in public brings evil upon himself. One is not so much as to greet a woman. Let not a man speak to a woman in the streets, no, not his own wife. Women could not own property, and their testimony in court was invalid. And so this lady had a social problem. She was the wrong person. She was a woman and not a man. But Jesus, in this passage of Scripture, as we've already discovered, he sits aside the social customs because he knew that salvation was more important. And that's the one thing that he wanted to give this woman the assurance of that her sin could be forgiven. Jesus not only spoke to this woman as she approached the well, he even asked her to give him a drink. No one else has done more to liberate women and, and elevate their social status than Jesus. That's why so many women uh, were so supportive of his ministry throughout his earthly ministry. That's why the last ones to leave the cross at the crucifixion were the women. And that's why the first ones to discover the tomb was empty and greet him on Resurrection Sunday was the women. So Jesus had to deal with a social problem. She was the wrong person. But second of all, there was a racial problem. She was from the wrong place. The woman, according to this passage of Scripture, she was a Samaritan. She was from Samaria. And we've already uh, stated the Samaritans, they didn't get along with the Jews. They hated each other. And this was because the Samaritans, they were a mixed race. They were part Jew and they were part Gentile. And this race of people developed in 727 B.C. when the ten northern tribes were taken captive by the Assyrians. There were marriages between Jews and Gentiles producing what many referred to as half-breeds. And when the Jews returned from Babylon and were rebuilding their temple, the Samaritans wanted to befriend the Jews. They wanted to help the Jews build their temple in Jerusalem. However, the Jews refused their help, and so the Samaritans built their temple on a mountain in Samaria, and the Jews had their temple in Jerusalem. And so this, this hatred of each other. It was deeply inward 
um, in, in both these groups of people. Uh, there was a racial problem. This woman was a, from the wrong place. But number three, there was a moral problem. She was engaged in the wrong practice. This woman that Jesus met at the well, she was living in sin. The woman came to the well at the sixth hour because no one else would be there at that time. The sixth hour would have been at noon, Jewish time. It would have been the hottest part of the day. She was considered a social outcast because of her immorality. This woman was ashamed to be in the presence of others. Listen, she was practicing social distancing before it was the thing to do. Surprised that Jesus would ask of her a Samaritan for a drink, this opened the door for Jesus to begin to deal with her about her sin. In the book of John in chapter before in verse number 10 through 15, we read this. Jesus answered and said unto her, If you knew the gift of God and who is, is, uh, and who it is who says to you, give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. Where, uh, where then do you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us this well and drink from it himself, as well as his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered and said to her, Whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain, of a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water that I may not thirst again nor come here to draw. Now, when Jesus witnessed the people, he was able to illustrate their real need by using different examples. When he spoke to Nicodemus, he talked to him about the new life. Here with this woman, Jesus speaks to her about living water because he knew her greatest thirst was inward and not outward. Water from Jacob's well would never satisfy the real thirst that this lady had. Jesus spoke to her real thirst when he told her, go get your husband and come here. She tells Jesus, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, you've truthfully answered. You have had five husbands, and the man you're living with now is not your husband. Now, there are many religious leaders today who would have dealt with her social problem and her racial problem, but they would have left her moral problem alone. They are so afraid of offending, losing a member, and a contribution that they willingly leave moral problems alone. However, these kinds of problems must be dealt with because sin separates us from God. And that is the biggest problem that this lady had. Her sin was separating her from holy God. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah, in chapter number 59, in verse number 1 and 2, Behold the Lord's hand is not shortened that he cannot save, nor his ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Here we meet a woman who is filled with trouble. Uh, she is discouraged. She is defeated because, listen, she's been in five failed relationships and you know you kind of wonder well, how in the world did this happen she probably believed every time that this is going to be the right one and each time she was wrong so she just decided not to marry again and she would just live with the next man Jesus knew the one thing he had to deal with was this woman's sin because listen sin is dangerous Sin is destructive, and sin is deadly. Sin is what the devil uses 
to destroy our lives. In the book of John, in chapter number 10, verse number 10, Jesus said this, The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that you may have life and that you may have it more abundantly. Jesus dealt with her social problem. He dealt with her racial problem. And he dealt with her moral problem. And notice, the closer he got to revealing her sin, the more she began to understand that she was not talking to just another Jewish rabbi. She recognized him first as a man, then as a Jew, then as a prophet, and finally she recognized him as the Christ, the Lord's Messiah. Her life story was a mess, but Jesus came to change all of that. Now notice next, her living Savior. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman, if your real thirst is going to be satisfied, the water from Jacob's well is not going to do it. You need the living water that I am able to give you. Jesus said, whoever drinks of this water um, that I shall give him will never thirst. But the water I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. John 4, 14. Now, the living water that Jesus wanted to give her was eternal life. Eternal life consisting in the knowledge of God and of his son, Jesus Christ. Living water is salvation, the full satisfaction of all the wants of the heart and the possession of all the holy energies of which the soul is easily influenced. An inner presence which produces an everlasting change. In the Old Testament, Jeremiah refers to God as the fountain of living water. And in John 7, 37 through 38, Jesus said, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow living waters. Salvation brings about the presence of God within us because of the Holy Spirit's indwelling. Jesus made this promise to his disciples in John 14, 16 and 17. He said, And I pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever. The Spirit of truth which the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. But you know him. Now watch this. For he dwells with you and will be in you. Jesus offers her living water, which would supply complete satisfaction. And because it comes from God, it will never run dry. The gift, God would, would, the gift of God would be completely inexhaustible, refreshing, life-giving, and forever. Her living Savior... But notice her liberated spirit. Number three, her liberated spirit. When Jesus asked her about a husband, she became uncomfortable and she changed the subject. And, and discussing a person's sin usually will cause this reaction. She changed the subject to religion, something she was a little bit more comfortable with. The Jews worshipped in Jerusalem, and the Samaritans worshipped in Samaria. And she wanted Jesus to tell us, tell her, which one of these places is the right place? Is the right place to worship in Samaria? Or is the right place to worship in Jerusalem? Jesus explained to her, it's not where you worship that's important, it's how you worship, and it's who you worship that really matters. And they had somewhat of a long discussion about this, and the lady was not really satisfied with all she was hearing Jesus say, but notice what she 
answers in John 4, 25 through 26. She says, I know the Messiah is coming, who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. And what she was really telling uh, Jesus is when the Messiah comes, when the Christ comes, he'll clear this all up. And Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. At that moment, the truth was revealed and the truth was received. She finally understood that she had been talking to God in the flesh, the Savior of the world. It was her belief in Jesus Christ that liberated and set her free from her bondage and sin. You can almost see the relief when you read these verses. And you can certainly hear the victory in her voice. Listen, salvation is forgiveness and deliverance from sin. The world is thirsty for deliverance and forgiveness of sin. I believe that just as Jesus wept over Jerusalem, he weeps over this planet today. If you'll remember, he said in the book of Matthew, chapter number 23, verse 37, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. That day... This lady of Samaria not only met Jesus, but she recognized him as Messiah. She recognized him as the Christ. She recognized him as the Savior of the world. And she not only recognized him, but she, she received him. And, and so we see her liberated spirit. We, we meet her living uh, Savior. Uh, but then finally, notice her love shared. She left her water pot and she ran back into the city and said to the men, come see a man who told me all things that, I, that ever I did. Could this be the Christ? Her life changed, resulted in her love shared. New life in Christ brings about a love for him, as well as a love for those who don't know him. We can only imagine the change these men must who have seen in this lady as she told them of what she experienced at the well. Her testimony was so powerful and her countenance was so changed that these men had to go out and see Jesus for themselves. They went out and they heard him for themselves. And notice what it says in John 4, 39. And many of the Samaritans of that city believed in him because of the word of the woman who testified, he told me all things that ever I did. In the closing parts of John's gospel, he tells us, uh, at the end, he could not write about everything that Jesus said because there would not be room enough to hold all of that information. I wonder if this was only a summary of what she said. Surely she would have mentioned how lovingly Jesus dealt with her sin as she talked to him about, as she talked to the men about him. Jesus confronted her sin lovingly because she'd already been hurt enough. She was a social outcast. She was talked about. She was laughed at. She was the talk of the town. Jesus shows this same kind of forgiveness to another woman, if you will remember. The Pharisees brought to Jesus a woman who had been caught in the very act of adultery. They said the law requires that she be stoned. And then they asked Jesus, what do you say? After having written something in the sand, Jesus looks up and he tells them, anyone here 
who is without sin, you cast the first stone. One by one, they left until everybody was gone. And the only ones that was left there was Jesus and the lady. Jesus then asked the woman, where are those that have accused you? She looked around and said, there are none. Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. Neither do I condemn you. Go and sin no more. What's Jesus doing? He's telling this lady to leave her life of sin. You see, Jesus loves us just the way we are, but he loves us too much to leave us the way we are. And anybody that has experienced a changed life, we are so thankful that Jesus Christ, our living Lord and our loving Lord, did not leave us exactly like he found us. God does not love us because we're valuable. We are valuable because God loves us. Question might be asked, when did God love us? The answer is given in the book of Romans in chapter number 5 and verse number 8. God demonstrated his own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. The Samaritan woman went back into the city and she said, come and see a man. He is a living Savior. He is a loving Savior. He is the Savior of the world. Jesus was the one man who solved all of her problems. He solved her social problem. She was the wrong person. He solved her racial problem. She was from the wrong place. And he solved her moral problem. She was engaged in the wrong practice. Listen, it makes no difference who you are, where you are from, nor what you have done. Jesus is the one that can satisfy your thirst and forgive your sin and make your life complete. You need to acknowledge him. You need to accept him willingly. You need to surrender to him daily and he will empower you to live a life filled with hope, joy, and victory. Jesus is the Savior of the world and he is waiting for you to receive him. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for this passage of Scripture and the changed life that the Samaritan woman enjoyed. We thank you for the power of our Savior that can change the life of anyone who puts their faith in you. I pray for those that might be carrying a heavy load. Their life is a mess. I want to pray that you'll help them to see as she saw that Jesus Christ is the one that can fix any problem. I pray that many will turn their attention to him and allow him to restore their hope and their life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
trusted that grace appeared. The hour I first believed. Through many dangers, tolls, and stairs, I Praise God. 